Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all the time. Puddles and I are here at uh, Benedictine University with Dr. Luis Libriel, who is the Associate Professor of Music here, and also the Chair of the Music Department at Benedictine University. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to Thank see you. you. It's been uh, nearly 30 years since uh, Luis and I uh, had a chance to sit down and, and chat. I think uh, my, one of my last memories is when we were at Northwestern, we were in a quintet. That's right. Together mm -hmm. and rehearsing and performing, but uh, you've gone on to do some, some really great things. Uh, Luis is an um, author, uh, very fairly recently, you know, uh, of how many volumes? Five? I think five now. Five yes. books, including uh, the latest, Brass Fundamentals, the uh, uh, lessons of Vincent Chickowitz, and the one that preceded this was Brass Singers. Brass Singers. The That's pedagogy right. of Arnold Jacobs. Exactly. And uh, well, I, I recommend uh, these volumes to you very highly. They're they're really uh, quite excellent. So I uh, thank you very much for that, uh, for all that effort and that work. You're welcome. Bringing uh, Mr. Jacobs' um, ideas and teaching to bear um, in in written form. It's so valuable for uh, for for going forward. You know, when he passed away. He, he passed away, but he continues to live in us who studied with him, and I think you're making a, 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 one, of those, one of those great voices uh, that we have today that's really uh, keeping his legacy alive, so thank you very much for that. Great, great, thank you. Yeah. Happy, happy to do it. Luis, I'm wondering, what was your, what was your time of study uh, with Mr. Jacobs? Well, I mean, the studying was 1994, um, 95, 96. And uh, I was in Minneapolis already playing professionally, uh, subbing with the orchestra, Minnesota Orchestra there, and I would fly down to study with Jacobs. And uh, it was kind of a plan he, he had in mind of uh, having you know, four or five lessons yeah. through the next, and he would give me enough to, to work. Yeah. And um, also it was really, really uh, encouraging to, of all of the research I was doing at the time, psychology, he thought it was great psychology and music, and, yeah. and he also invited me to call him on Sundays, and I would, and he would spend a good 10, 15 minutes talking to me mm -hmm. about items. So that was, that was a great time. You know, before then, I also translated lessons for him, Spanish and English. So you'd have uh, Spanish, he would have Spanish students come in, exactly. Spanish-speaking students come in, That's true. and you would, you would translate. Translate, and it was an amazing experience because uh, he was telling me what to say. I had no idea what was what I was. You saying. didn't know what you were saying, and what the yeah. student improved. So, I feel like magic, you know, it's yeah. incredible. And before then, when I was 17, I, I played at the Fine Arts Building, the uh, Classical Youth Symphony. Yeah. And uh, and you know, you could go to his studio and hear what he was teaching before. Yeah. So we would sneak in and and, uh, and kind of keep track of his lessons. Yeah. And uh, that was that was really really exciting time too. So yeah, over, over the years I, I was in contact with him, and at the end was when I studied. And, so, and then prior to that you were studying with uh, Mr. Chikowitz, Chikowitz. Uh, Luther Didrikson, yes. Mr. Scarlett, yes. Yes, and yes. I assume that you were studying with uh, Manny Luriano up in uh, Minneapolis a little bit, maybe, as well as Mr. Baldwin? Exactly. Well, after that I went to um, uh, do a DMA in trumpet there, and uh, so I had uh, Gary Borner of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, uh, David Baldwin, a great soloist, really great teacher and Manny Lariano of the Minnesota Orchestra and it was a great trio and we worked very hard on repertoire a very intense mm -hmm. very intense period and uh, and at the same time I was flying down to study with Jacobs yeah so that was a, and uh, so that was a really really great time um, after that I went to Europe and I came back and, and I remember talking to Jacob a few times and he passed away yeah did, did, did you, uh, was it uh, studying with those people that, that work well, in, you know, concurrently with Jacobs? Was there a similar message that was coming through for all three of them? Or was Absolutely. anything conflicting? And you also studied with Gitala for a, a period of time. I did, well. I did, I did. And uh, uh, that was, uh, now I think of it, it's not conflicting. But back then it was. And um, especially a kind of a humorous uh, event with Chikowicz. He wasn't very pleased with that. Okay. I'm going to see. But, um, uh, but it was a great opportunity. It was one year. And it would take a few lessons. And Getala was great. Uh, but it wasn't conflicting. He talked more about embouchure and focus, which is really important, you know, yeah. and uh, in what we do. Um, but yes, that, that, that was uh, 
Well, if I gave you a year, that was like 1985. Mm -hmm. So coming to, I mean, you came to Jake um, fairly, you know, pretty advanced. Yeah, very advanced. In your yeah. uh, in your development as a mm -hmm. as an artist and a performer, um, what do you remember? What maybe what that first lesson was like, or what you came away with over those those few years? Absolutely. Well, he he tested me. He said I was playing well, and he pushed me to the edge. I think he I played uh, the Haydn trumpet concerto and six top tones. I remember thinking, my God, he must be, maybe he's tired because he's not teaching me, but actually he was having me play until I got tired. Uh -huh. And I started to get fatigue and then uh, lost a little bit of control and that's, he said, now we can start the lesson. Oh. So that's what he was doing, he was pushing me to the he was, he was, yeah, he was, he, was, he was running you through your paces. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I noticed, you know, in listening to all of those lessons, I, I auditioned for these books, um, he would do that to students. The first five minutes were his five minutes to, to see what you were about, you know. Yeah. Had, had you play, was watching you, see how you, you behaved. And, and uh, he had you uh, all set up after five minutes and then he would start the lesson. I remember him saying that, uh, you know, usually the first lesson was really the lesson for him. <laughs> exactly. To just to learn how to communicate with you, um, just to find out wh what method of communication worked well with you. That's exactly it. And um, uh, those types of things, as well as just to hear what you were doing. Well, what did he determine after you, uh, when you got to the edge of fatigue? What, how did the lesson progress at that point? Well, to, to stay singing, because that's the only thing that's going to make everything work. Yeah. And um, so, you know, one of the um, items when you keep singing, you're actually singing with the lips, you know, so, so that the vocal cords vibrating is your lips. It's the same message, yeah. the same cranial nerve, according to Jacobs. And so when you're singing, uh, your lips are buzzing in the direction of the wind, which is really important, you know. So you can imagine the, whip, the winds flapping outward. And so the wind continues to, to flow, and there is no backup of the wind, so essential. Now, if you stop singing, in your head, the lips might clump together. And especially in trumpet, that's a problem. Because then you start to have the backup yeah. and all the problems that come with that, yeah. you know, and to the compression you know, of air inside. So that was essential. Now, of course, when you're tired, fatigued, you're in a concert, and you have a few high notes to play, your brain starts to be overactive and stop singing. And start to really focus on how it feels. Exactly. Yeah. And then you lose control, the lips clump together, and then it's a, like a vicious circle. And so, yeah, the, really the answer always is keep singing you know, in, the, in, the, in the head. Yeah. So that was the lesson, and that was really good. Yeah, it sounds like a, sounds like a, great, a great time. Luis, you've, um, you've written these, these five books. I'm wondering if you can tell me about the process um, that you undertook to, to write, um, you know, The Lasting Change, um, The Brass Singers, um, The New Brass, Fundamentals. uh, Brass Fundamentals. Um, it's quite a, and all within a fairly compact, relatively compact amount of time. Yes. That yes. must have been uh, quite the project. Can you describe that? Well, it starts years uh, before that, and, and it took me 10 years to process the, uh, the hours and hours of lessons uh, on tapes. I, I was very fortunate, I have to say, I had uh, people who trusted me with their lessons. These are trumpet players who recorded their lessons. Uh, from 1967 to 1998, and uh, Jacobs actually asked them to do that. And they kept the, the lessons all those years, and uh, so again, they trusted me to listen to them and transcribe them. And so it took 10 years to do that, it's 500 hours. 500 hours of tapes, uh, of lessons. Tapes. Yeah. And my goal was to find a pattern. Why was uh, Jacobs' teaching so uh, effective and efficient? And that's what I observed when I was 17 years old, watching him teach. It was fast, it was quick. The improvement was immediate. Mm -hmm. Then I knew the players, and I knew that the improvement was lasting. It would last months and months. So why did that happen? And so that, that was the goal. Uh, it took 10 years. So the books come after that. Now, I had to also find a pattern that unified the whole method. That was pure luck. I found uh, system theories and uh, the work of Ken Wilber, who actually eventually edited some of the work. Okay. And um, and it's uh, how to put everything together and see it like almost like a machine, like or a map. Yeah. And um, it doesn't mean that you're going to teach exactly how Jacobs taught, but it's useful to see the map to see where you're going. Yeah. 
And so that's basically the process. I also have to say that um, I had the fortune to have worked with a great oral historian, Stott Sterkel, yes. and a great writer. And he did a similar process. I worked with him two and a half years. And so I kind of learned the method of taking the interviews, uh, putting them together, unifying them, and creating something very useful. And that's what the books, I think, are. Well, each yeah. one is different. You know? And so, they, in other words, they, they, uh, the transcription of the lessons don't exactly go directly or the interviews into the book. You have to create something out of it. Yeah. So your time with studs was very, very helpful. Extremely helpful. And plus, we interviewed some of the great writers in the world, too. So yeah. you keep learning you know, from these people. And uh, so it was quite a process. Yeah, so uh, altogether, it was 15 years or so. Now, these 500 hours, was it just trumpet, or was it a mixture, or what was it? Just trumpet. OK, and just so trumpet. that kind of leads me to another question. How, you know, there's tuba, high flow, low pressure, trumpet, mm -hmm. low flow, high pressure, yes. you know, it seems like they wouldn't meet together. But, and yet he was so effective. Well, can you just, can you? Describe how was why was Jake so effective in teaching certainly tuba but also all the brass instruments. Yes, because we you know when you break it down, or the number one item he worked on, I think the most essential is what's going on in your head. Yeah, the singing, and that's same the same with everybody, and um, different repertoire, but the singing has to be there, and so that was the number one deficiency, in everybody. Uh, then the other item number two is the, the posture breath and um, so yeah if you're slouching that's the same with every instrument you're going to have problems if you're a shallow breather in other words you take a, a small little breath and try to play or a great bravura or a great solo you're going to most likely to have problems so those those are common problems um, the other items uh, there were a couple of things Jacob's good on teaching trumpet I have to mention that it's a repertoire he hadn't played it Mm -hmm. It was like he never played Petrushka on the trumpet, for example, or right. other five. And then sometimes he would send the students to specialized teachers, like Scarlett, Herseth, you know. And, um, but other than that, he applied completely to the trumpet. Now, one thing I have to mention, too. Jacobs taught trumpet players um, to play the great bravuras, you know. In other words, the great solos, the Tomasi, the yeah. Haydn, you know. And those solos required maximum efficiency in playing. Mm -hmm. And that was what we focused on in the lessons, you know, mainly. And uh, so I have to always mention that. You can play a trumpet just by taking a little breath and playing a little thing, but, yeah. but when it comes to playing a Tomasi, you have to be efficient. Yeah, right. So, so Luis, uh, you know, you had those 500 hours of tapes, which is oh, such a tremendous um, uh, resource, really, I think, unparalleled. Yeah, uh, unprecedented. It is. It is yeah, it is. And um, I'm wondering if you might have what you noticed during the, that that because you said it was 1968 to 19 1967 to 1998. Nine, oh, so yeah, to two months before he passed away. Yeah, so it was very to the end. What did you notice, if anything, uh, about how you know Jacob's pedagogy? Did it change? Did it evolve? Um, what can you say about that? Well, it, it evolved. Um, Early on, he would go into more of the scientific explanations of what was going on, which is, um, I think it would maybe confuse some students, and uh, they took them away from thinking about music. And uh, forward, fast forward 30 years, and then he just uh, focused on uh, what was essential, which was the singing part. That would fix all the physical yeah. part. Right. And um, so he wouldn't go into the lengthy explanations of what was going on in the body. He would maybe mention it to you. And he also, important, he mentioned a way to fix the problem. And, um, but he wouldn't go into lengthy explanations. Uh, one item was that uh, about 1971, he was teaching this student, and the student having trouble on playing. He was, I think, maybe the basement of his house. Mm -hmm. And Jacobs got a little bit frustrated, maybe, and he picked up his tuba, and he played, and beautiful, I mean, just incredible, and, um, and demonstrated to the student what it was supposed to sound like, and the student was fixed instantly. And the student said, uh, said, you see, he said um, something like, you see, by listening to it, I, I, I got the idea. And Jacobs kind of stopped and kind of thought about that, maybe, for a minute. And after that, the lessons changed. 
Really? You know, he, yes, I, I, with that student, I, yeah. I, I noticed this. Kind of, maybe he realized that um, maybe with this student, I need to change the approach yeah. in teaching. And so, so as less explanation, more, he didn't demonstrate as much, but more into how he had to sound. Yeah. So that was, that was really interesting, that moment you know, in the lessons. And that was certainly uh, by the 1980s, he started to change his teaching. In the 1990s was, I think, uh, the most uh, simplistic way of teaching of the 30 years I listened to. Very good. It's, I just can't get over the, 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 uh, the amount of, of uh, hours that you had mm -hmm. available to you, and, uh, and it, it would take, I mean, it would, of course it would take 10 years to go through them and transcribe them and catalog them and... No, absolutely. You know, one of the things I, a pattern that I saw in his lessons, and, um, and again, this evolved as well, but uh, the first five minutes Jacobs would listen to you, would get to know you, yeah. especially, especially the first lesson, see how you work, so he, to see how you thought mm -hmm. that he would, could work with you. And um, then he would uh, have you play, get involved in music always. And so the art form was first. And then he would wait until you start to lose control or make a mistake. All along he knew what was, what, what, what was a problem or what technical difficulties you had, but yeah. he let you play. And then uh, at that moment when you had lost control or made a mistake, then he would introduce what was going on, a, a problem, a thought, a concept. And most important, he would explain it so well, just maybe like a doctor would explain to you what's going on yes. with your body, very yes. clear, yeah. very simple. And then he would give you a way to fix it. Telling you about the problem is not good enough. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. You have to have the... yeah, you have to have the solution. And he would give you a solution that um, we started to call the home teacher. Like, mm -hmm. you take this home and it will teach you. And you do it for six months, a year, sometimes two years. Yeah. And the repetition was really important. And that's part of the lasting changes that we observed in his lessons was that he was, he very clear told you what was going on, but also gave you a home teacher or a way to fix it so you could repeat it at home and have all these successes over the next six months to a year. And that way the problems were eliminated. See, a, a bad habit or a problem maybe develop over two or three years and overnight you can, you can improve it. Yeah. But for it to be permanent, the repetition of it over again six years to a year is really important. Did you notice, uh, was there any, uh, any patterns in terms of how he dealt with uh, player injuries uh, in these tapes or um, certain, certain problems? Um, uh, you know, did he ever deal with embouchure changes? You know, how did he deal with, with, with students who are hypersensitive or hyper-focused mm -hmm. on embouchure, these types of things? Exactly. Um, an aging process is the other one that's really important. I ignored that part yeah. <laughs> when I was <laughs> studying with him, but I became very well versed in it about six years ago. Six years ago, yeah. <laughs> starts to change. Well, anything that, that rattles your mind and kind of drives you away from thinking about music. Yeah. And that's, that's the common denominator with all of these problems. So you get, um, someone hits you in the lip, it's swollen, you cannot play, your mind is hyperactive. Yeah, some physical uh, things, uh, you know, it's a muscle. If it gets injured, it might not function well. But, but, um, but yeah, the, what the common denominator is the mind goes hyperactive and scattered and not focus on music. And what I observed, he really get, would get everybody back to singing, maybe with very easy material, maybe a hymn, something that you knew from childhood, yes. you know? And uh, so, so you use your musical imagination. The muscles are amazing. The muscles will uh, follow what's in your mind. Yeah. You know, so so they, start, they start to function better. Now, that said, there are some physical uh, problems that are problems. And so uh, I think um, um, uh, I think someone got a, a, a hit in the, in the lip and it was swollen and it was a, a big um, uh, damage yeah. happened and he said, you know, just don't play for two months. Sure. You know, it's, it's this kind of situation. So yeah, you gotta let it heal. Exactly, you have to let things heal. And uh, so there are physical uh, problems that have to be corrected first. But, but yeah, I like to refer to the uh, psychological aspect, which is stay focused on music and, uh, and the muscles will follow. Can you talk a little bit about, speaking of psychology, you know, you, 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 you had some time 
in the 90s where you would uh, um, just talk about psychology and, and performing and that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh, with Jake, yes. um, with Mr. Jacobs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you, you've, you've come, that's kind of come into uh, its own um, area of expertise for you. Yes, and I have to say I'm no, I'm no psychologist. I yes. don't have a right. PhD on it. But, but, um, but you know, it goes back to Chikowitz. Um, um, Chikowitz had in his studio a bookshelf full of books of uh, psychology. And I was really intrigued. I would always be looking at those books during my lessons. And she always noticed. And, um, and I remember I couldn't go back home you know, for breaks. And she always knew it. So he's, uh, he said, Luis, would you like to you know, read one of the books? Because, you know, and I would ask about the books, too. So, so, so I started to borrow his books. And that's how I started to get into psychology. The first book was Percy Bach's Psychology for Musicians, mm -hmm. 1944. And that Jacobs read, and she always read as well. And uh, after that, I read about um, really about 800 books. You know, after that, um, so be reading for decades. You know, 800. 800, yeah. And, and some of them were not very useful, but uh, some of them were. But the point is, when I talked to Jacobs about uh, the readings I was doing and so on and so forth, he knew about them. Yeah. Which is remarkable. Yeah. This man read he a did. lot and thought about it and integrated it to, to, his, uh, to his teaching. So there was a lot of psychology in his teaching, it's just we didn't know it, because he's not telling you about it. Right. But behind the scenes, he's organizing everything in a really uh, a, uh, effective way, because I think he, he knew how people learn. Yeah, he didn't want to alert you to, he wanted to go through the back door. Yeah, So exactly. as not to, not to illuminate your thoughts to get focused on. Exactly, but I think he knew what was going on in terms yeah. of learning and, and uh, how yeah. people uh, absorb materials and what yeah. to do and not to do. Well, Luis, I could sit here uh, really all day talking with you, but uh, I know that you're you're a busy man, and, and uh, of course, Puddles, you know, he has to groom his feathers. So, um, um, uh, just want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and. Uh, share your time and your thoughts and the information that you have about Mr. Jacobs. Uh, it's really quite enormous and remarkable. And uh, Puddles, he was um, um, always, you know, reminding me to, to be a good host. And uh, so he'd like to present you with uh, the uh, this genuine University of Oregon chocolate duck nuts. Oh, great! That's uh, fantastic. You, well, yeah. thank you so much. And thank welcome. you, Mike, for all the work you're doing too. Yeah, you know the people. So. It's great Absolutely. to see you, Louise. Same here. Yeah. 30 years. 30 years. I love that. Great. Back to you.